All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Devin Mann, the single co-chair of Southeast Neighbors, although I have a rotating co-chair here with me today. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order, and I'm just going to read uh, the little housekeeping thing. And it, The board is no longer recording meetings until the city of Eugene changes the online meeting platform and digital storage options. Okay, that's happening. This will be the last meeting on Zoom. And that means that all hybrid options will be offered on Google Meet after this, and which we all need to learn how to use it. Oh boy. <laughs> so um, it's the city is changing their platform and canceling their Zoom account. So that's just how it's going to be. More information about that as we are able to provide it. Um, Personal video and audio recordings may not be reproduced in any form without informed consent of the individuals represented, i.e. all you guys, like the non-board members that are here. Um, you may want to keep your privacy, that kind of thing, so we discourage that kind of stuff because sometimes things can show up somewhere else. Tonight, um, there, because it's disaster preparedness and they want to record the speakers, there is a camera recording but it will not face the audience it will just face the, the speakers so if anyone has an, an issue with that we should probably you should sit somewhere maybe over to the side or somewhere like that but it really is just recording this direction so. um, the first thing we're going to do um, is public comment so if you're here and you'd like to make a three minute public comment, we're going to have to keep it pretty close to three because we've got, we've got a hard stop when we're at Hilliard because they only have so much time to clean up and, or we only have so much time to clean up and get out before they kick us off. So we're going to try to keep that on schedule. Um, so if you're a member of the online audience, um, uh, raise your hand or use the little hand emoji if you want to make public comment. Um, if you're in the audience, just raise your hand for public comment. And um, I will um, start that now. So it's, I'm going to be trying to keep track of the time. So does anyone have public comment? <coughs> been a little dormant lately, but we have uh, functioned over the years to bring people from different neighborhoods together to discuss preparedness for a variety of disasters. We're trying to get that started again. Our main activity was an online forum, Zoom, about monthly. This month, our Lane County's new emergency uh, manager will be our guest and tell about her priorities. She's quite capable from a county that has had tsunamis, or could have, and she sits on the OSPAC, and she manages our emergency management systems. You are, you can find information on our Facebook group, our Eugene Neighbors Preparedness Network, uh, and you can also find it on this little stuff here, although you can type in the numbers but to join us. You just have to give your email if you want to be taken off the email list later, that's fine too. Just email us back. But thank you. Thank you. I'm just checking up there. Maybe you can check up there. Does anyone else have a public comment to make tonight? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Warnes, and thank you for coming out here tonight. I'm uh, announcing that I'm running for Ward 2 City Council. The reason why I'm running is because I'm not, uh, not real happy with the representation we've had over the last four years. And um, I intend to follow more of the path of Betty Taylor, and she has also endorsed me, so that's good news. Thank you for that, Betty Taylor. I have lived in this ward also for 44 years. I started working with Betty during, uh, or back in the early 2000s, and during that time I started a grassroots effort 
to stop development in a fragile watershed known as the Amazon headwaters in the southeast and southwest hills. What was that like? Oh, okay. It's, okay. I'm, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. people coming and going from the online. So, okay. <laughs> And now there is a 40-acre, anyway, so we stopped development in um, some of the areas in the southeast hills. And that area is back in, right about in here. And it's a 40-acre parcel that is now in a parkland inventory in the city of Eugene. And I'm very proud about that. Um, I served on this body as well for many years as vice chair. And also I've served on the uh, Eugene Planning Commission. So I feel like I, brought, I can bring... Um, a uh, well-rounded uh, um, experience and knowledge from, you know, bringing uh, neighborhood issues into the city and then getting some results. Um, my concerns for our residents in Ward 2 are uh, at the top of the list is infill and com compatibility standards, the aftermath of House Bill 2001, and the fact that the city chose to go the whole they chose the whole enchilada instead of adopting the minimum standards, which is, I think, what it should have been done. But um, anyway, this is becoming a very contentious uh, issue in several parts of the city, and right here in, U in uh, Ward 2 as well. And um, affordable housing is not middle housing, and I will make sure we adopt affordable housing as uh, priority number one. If the city is giving away our tax dollars to developers for a 10-year period, I say, why not use that money to implement affordable housing? Um, property taxes, they're going up. They're no longer affordable. Uh, we're looking also at utility bills going up over 40% in the next three to four years. Uh, so I think spending tax dollars giving uh, developers a 10-year tax incentive break uh, while we have 3,000 people, homeless people, living in our streets right now, I say we need to be more accountable with our tax dollars. Um, so anyway, um, also I think we're going to need to uh, pass bond measures to, um, to uh, mitigate wild, wildfires. Uh, that's going to be a real reality here, folks. And, um, you know, I think the M Stadium is a bad idea, the location, and I also think it's an irresponsible way to spend taxpayers' dollars. I hate it's to interrupt you, but we're going to get wrapped up. It's a three-minute. Okay. But Thanks. that's great. I mean. Okay. Sorry. All right. Good. Good. Well, anyway. We're not doing questions and answers. No, no. Not, not just, right just now. Just your her name. I oh. I got cards and stuff right. for you if you, you want. Lisa yeah, we'll put them on the table back. I will, I will. And uh, I, I'm just going to bring a higher level of citizen involvement, fiscal transparency, and I'm asking for your vote, your support. My website is on here. I will leave these cards in the back of the room. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right. Any public comment out in the online world? Look like it. All right. Well, um, with that, um, we have board member John Ostrom is going to talk to us a little bit about the board. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here in person and out there in Zoom land. I'm only going to take a few minutes of our time, which for I know will be some great presentations. So to keep us going on, uh, I will be very brief. I really have one overarching message for all of you tonight. We want you. I am currently serving as an at-large board member, and we are one of 18 active neighborhood organizations. And as the ebbs and flows go in neighborhood organizations, there are times when we really need to recruit and other times when it's not as important. Well, this is a time when we want you. We want you. You folks out there in Zoom land too. We want you. We need you. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about what it would be like joining our board and or joining one of our committees because typically we fill our pipeline by folks coming onto our committees and coming onto the board. So that's one option as well. So if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. 
So we had an election coming up on May 14th for our next SEN board uh, election. We have five open positions. Two incumbents are running. I'm one of those. I'm up for election this May. If all five positions are filled, that will take us to a full slate of 10 board members, and that's what we would really like. So I am recruiting tonight. We are recruiting. I'll give you a little bit of feeling of what we do as a board and what our committees do. And again, I'll keep this very brief. But this election is May 14th, so about two months from now, 7 to 9 p.m., right here and remote. It shouldn't say Zoom. It will be on Google Meets, so we'll have remote voting and in person again May 14th right here. All positions are elected as an at-large member. I am currently an at-large member. We serve two-year staggered terms, so approximately half of us run uh, every two years, but not everybody runs every year. So every year some folks are up for election. Of whatever the total amount of board members we have, we internally elect four officers, two co-chairs, a secretary, and a treasurer. So on May 14th, after the election, we will all take a few minutes and then internally select who will be the four officers. So if you're at all interested, and I have a few more slides to give a little more details, but if you're all interested, the formal request to run and obtain the candidate questions are available by emailing us at southeast.eug at gmail.com. There are a few candidate questions that we do ask people to, to answer, and those actual, their answers, your responses will be available for viewing at our website, southeastneighbors.org, approximately the 1st of May. Correct, Devin, about the 1st of May? We'll have the answers. Yes, sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> yes, whatever he said, yes. So not to confuse you all, those are the candidate questions if you want to run for the board. We also have a list of questions in the back tonight just to get you thinking about what you might want to do for SEN, for the Southeast Neighbors, not necessarily the board. Lucy has so kindly come up with a list of questions. Those are on the back table. Next slide. So what are the expectations of the board? You probably want to know what we do and what we expect if you uh, choose to do this. We do meet once a month, year round, usually the first Tuesday of every month. Um, one of those monthly meetings, one of those 12 annual meetings will be a board retreat. We started doing board retreats last year. This year we'll have our board retreat in June. We do meet here, and I got it right this time, starting next in April, we'll be on Google Meets, so we will continue on with a hybrid approach for meetings if you don't want to be in person, even as a board member. We start at 7 p.m. We usually go for an hour to an hour and a half. We're usually done by 8.30. And all we really ask is to show up with ideas and perspective and be prepared and engaged. On top of the 12 board meetings, we have three general meetings per year. Well, we actually have four, but one of them is our picnic. But outside of the picnic, we have three general meetings per year. Currently, they're in March, as tonight. May, the elections, which I talked about, May 14th, and November. These are subject to change in 2025. I think they will change. I think we'll change those dates. But for this year, March, May elections, November. Two of those three general meetings typically have outside guest presentations like we have tonight. We have an annual picnic at Tugman Park. It's historically been in September. It doesn't have to be in September, but it will be in September this year because of all the road construction on Hilliard by, by Ewa. And we ask all board members to participate on at least one committee. You don't have to be a chairperson, but we want participation on one of our committees, which takes me to the next slide. If you don't want to jump right into being on the board. We do have five active committees currently. We have environmental stewardship, and we tackle items such as planting trees along Amazon Creek, or looking into phasing out of uh, gas-powered lawn equipment, or 
hearing what the city and the county and the state is doing on ecology issues and pollution issues. So a whole host of things. Uh, the next is Friends of Tugman Park, which I see a few Tuggers here tonight, which is awesome. Uh, we're a very dedicated group of volunteers who show up at least twice a month, and we're involved at Tugman Park in an overall way of um, enhancing biodiversity and uh, renewing the, the native uh, plantings at the park. That's not all we do, but that's our main mission. Ready Southeast, which you're all probably aware of because it's our Ready Southeast, which does everything around disaster preparedness, and they so kindly arranged for our guest speakers tonight. Of course, Ready Southeast deals with everything from ice storms to fire, as we'll hear tonight, also uh, Cascadia earthquakes, whatever our community needs and the city needs to be more prepared. We have an active transportation committee who handles anything you can think of transportation from mass transit at the county level, uh, LTD, uh, down to bike safety, pedestrian safety, road maintenance, traffic issues. Uh, so they're a very active committee as well. The last committee is our picnic committee. It is not a year-round committee. We meet four or five months of the year to plan the annual picnic, which again will be this September, date to be announced at Tugman Park. So that's about all I have for you, except please visit our website for a lot more details on the committees. You can read everybody's mission, our goals, our work plans, um, see a few photos. So please check out in way more detail what these committees do. Also, if you're interested in getting our monthly digital newsletter, please make sure you all sign the sign-in sheet. Um, because we currently, I think the digital newsletter goes out to over a thousand email addresses. Our paper snail mails, which we still do in the form of postcards and newsletters, go out to over 5,000 uh, addresses. So we're lagging a little bit in email addresses, so if you'd like to get a digital monthly newsletter, please make sure you sign up on the back table. So that's about all I have for you. It, it, it might sound like a lot, and you know what? It is, we do a lot. We are a really engaged neighborhood organization and we want you. So, thank you. So, before we get to our speakers tonight, uh, we have another very brief presentation from another board member. Jerry Meenahan will be joining us here in a second when the slides go away. He will be on Zoom. And Jerry wants to speak to us briefly um, to give us an introduction to Eugene Citizens United for Better Sidewalks. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jerry Minahan, and um, I am an at-large board member of the Southeast Neighbors. Uh, I'm also a uh, member of the City of Eugene's Active Transportation Committee, uh, although I am not here representing that committee. Um, before I get into my very brief uh, presentation, I just wanted to reinforce uh, John's uh, call for volunteers and uh, uh, members of the, the board. Uh, I've had a really wonderful time uh, serving on the board. Uh, for the past almost two years, and um, can't recommend it enough. It's a group of very dedicated, uh, capable, kind, and, and ultimately very helpful people. So um, I would encourage you to consider that. Um, however, uh, I'm not here for that. I'm here instead to uh, represent a, a loose knit group of. Um, citizens, uh, we're calling ourselves the Eugene Citizens United for Better Sidewalks. Uh, and if you uh, would allow me, I would like to read you a proclamation that this group has developed, and then I would like to point you in the direction of a petition that you can look out for and uh, potentially uh, sign uh, to uh, support our cause. So first, uh, I'll begin with the proclamation, which states, Our city government knows the importance of sidewalks. 
I quote, safe sidewalks benefit pedestrians, people in wheelchairs, joggers, and others who use sidewalks to travel around town. Safe, clean, and hazard-free sidewalks promote mobility and livability for the citizens of Eugene. The community and citizens benefit from having pedestrian-friendly sidewalks and driveway approaches as part of the city's overall transportation system, end quote. Sadly, we residents of Eugene find that our sidewalks are clearly not safe, clean, and hazard-free. Many are in poor and deteriorating condition and pose a significant risk for tripping and falling. We call on city leaders to, one, develop a plan to substantially improve the condition of Eugene's sidewalks over the next 10 years, and two, devise a stable, adequate, and equitable funding mechanism for ongoing sidewalk repair. We agree that 100% of Eugene residents are pedestrians some of the time. Everyone uses our sidewalks. Many depend on walking to meet basic needs because of age, ability, and to save money. Walking is an important component of our health and neighborhood life. Walking supports our local economy. Many home and business owners in our neighborhoods cannot afford to repair the sidewalks. It is expensive. Sidewalks are transportation infrastructure, just like streets and bike paths. There does not appear to be an effective plan for fixing the sidewalks. Indeed, they are steadily getting worse. We urgently call on city leaders to develop a long-term funding mechanism to fix CGN's sidewalks. Uh, so, thanks for hearing that out. And um, I should also mention that our group has a, a petition put together uh, the, a shortened form of that proclamation and a link where you can sign on as individuals. Uh, currently, we don't have a website, and it's uh, difficult in this medium um, to uh, point you towards uh, that. However, I would like to mention that um, our good friend uh, John Q. Murray has uh, on his website, Whole Community News, which is at wholecommunity.news. Uh, posted an article titled Concerned Citizens Launch Petition for Better Sidewalks. And you can find that at wholecommunity.news on the second page uh, where that article is listed in many other uh, recent local news stories. Um, I will also mention that I'm going to be asking my friends at, at Southeast Neighbors to uh, support this as a group and as individuals and hopefully in the near future there will be um, uh, links to the petition uh, perhaps on the Southeast Neighbors website and perhaps on their social media sites as well. So um, thanks for your time and uh, hearing me out and uh, I hope that um, you're able to connect to our petition and to our cause in the near future. Thank you. My name is Dennis Hebert. I'm currently the treasurer of Southeast Neighbors. Uh, John Ostrom did a, just a wonderful overview of the board. There's, there, there's one more thing that I'd like to just put out to everybody, that uh, the Nightingale posted shelter that we have right down the street here, that was in part helped along by the Southeast Neighbors board. They came to us asking approval for getting so many huts to start with and we approved the expanding and now we feel that they're just a wonderful contributor to our neighborhood. Uh, I spoke with Tracy just last week and she said she wanted me to thank everyone here and to everyone in our audience and all of our neighbors for how they've just been so wonderful to helping them out with giving them blankets and socks and jackets and just, just seem to be whatever they need. So I asked Stacy, well, Tracy, excuse me, what do you need? She says, well, we need AAA and AA batteries, and we like those little hand warmers. She said, that's all we need right now. So if anybody wants to help contribute, those are the two things that they're asking for right now, do these cold snaps and everything. I'll take one question, Ms. Ma'am. I heard them request funds for putting in showers last year. Do you know anything about that? That's uh, still in the works. They actually got a water tower with a shower, and as soon as the e-web is done, they're going to have water and electricity there. So that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, now, 
We have a wonderful presentation this evening, and right now I'd like to introduce Mr. David Monk. He has been a member of the Southeast Board for way many years. He resigned from the board, and now he's uh, pretty full-time working with disaster preparedness in the Ready Southeast. And I'll have him come introduce our speakers for this evening. David. So before I do that, we're pretty tight on time, so I'm going to add a little song and dance break, uh, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, we're going to start the part first because I think the, the presentations lend themselves to the part starting. So, so if you don't know, the Disaster Preparedness Committee program uh, focused on getting you all uh, independently prepared in your homes with your families to be without food and water, outside help for two weeks. <coughs> Right? So secondly, we're trying to encourage you and help you, if you need help, to connect with your nearby neighbors. Because clearly, uh, if we have a Cascadia event, we're going we're gonna to be counting on our neighbors. Our lives can depend on our neighbors. So that's kind of the thrust of what we do. We've been doing it for almost 10 years now. So now we, are, we have emergency supplies all over the neighborhood. We have, we're at 75 volunteers now, all with communication devices that can can speak to one another, we can speak, we have ham radio operators that we can connect with the emergency operations center of the city of Eugene. So that's the only way, through a ham radio operator. Through a ham radio, can you speak with the emergency operations center? So it's, it's, um, it's a program that's, that's quite mature this time. And we're hoping that if and when we have a major event, we're, we're ready to respond to it and help our neighbors. So, if, if you're all interested, I've got a, some, uh, I've got a sign up back there. This is my song again. Yeah, like, you could. <laughs> and many of these people in the, neighbor, in, in the room tonight have this. Many of the board members have this. Yeah, that's exactly so. This could, this could be yours. Along with the little FRS radio if you're interested. So, uh, what, I'll be hanging around. So after the presentations, reach out to me, OK? So I'm actually. The former chair of the committee, Heather Salicki, is now the current chair. She did, a, she did a work plan for us in our committee meeting the other night. That's fabulous. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that she's taken over and I'm very confident that the program will uh, grow rapidly from here. There's some things that I want to make you aware of. Heather brought this. This is on, all these are on the back table. This, this is, uh, you know, in this ice storm, very different storm than we've had in the past, right? That ice was hard. It stayed in place for a long time. I think there were 1,200 calls for service from people falling in the ice by, you know, ambulance and EMTs. So one of these is back. I encourage you to take one. Likewise, I brought some. This is a good wildfire handout, things you can do around your home. This is something we use if you are at home. Help, okay, depending on whether you need help, you put this in your front window. Please take one if you want. On the other side is essentially the nine steps of what to do after an earthquake. And then lastly, we have our brochure, which has a really good insert with all kinds of other resources online. Okay, so please feel free to take any of that. I'm now going to introduce Bart. He's <coughs> doing this fabulous. Um, so, Bart Johnson is a professor emeritus of landscape architecture at the University of Oregon. His research focuses on enhancing society's capacity to adapt and innovate in the face of climate change. There's a particular focus on wildfire, fire stewardship, and sustaining life's diversity. As you all know, I don't know if you have read what happens happening in Texas in the wintertime, right? Fire is part of our, always has been part of our landscape. We really need to be prepared, even in an urban setting, to address fire and to have a plan for you and your family how to evacuate. And just one last note, um, one of the things that um, we come to is that where we can, our volunteers can be of um, importance and help to our neighbors if, if we have to evacuate. We're assuming that many of the evacuation routes may be uh, unavailable to us. Trees down, power lines down, put out, roadbed, buckles. The police department has told us they, they can't help us. They don't have enough 
officers to come out, assess the, the roads, and then report that to us. So it's gonna be up to us, our volunteers, to do that assessment, which we will do in real time as soon as they've taken care of their families and their nearby neighbors. Uh, and then we're hoping to be able to get that information to as many people. And we're trying to figure out how do we do that in a, an emergency situation where people are you know, getting into their cars. Tonight I wanted to, and I invited this gentleman. He, he and his family came from Paradise. They survived the fire there. He lost his mother-in-law and his niece. They were in their car trying to escape. What he told me, uh, we live up on Fox Hollow, just above uh, Spencer View. He's not getting in his car. He's taking, he's grabbing his go bag. He's uh, leading his family to the Spencer View School. So you might think about what big open space you have close to you and think about going there rather than getting in your car. And if you get in your car, go at the first opportunity. Don't wait till the very last because that's when everybody's going to be out on the road and we're all going to be jammed up. Okay? Okay. Professor Johnson. Thank you, David. So, I, I know some of you might be here tonight. I'm really excited to hear the next speakers after me. I'm a wildfire researcher. I've worked with prescribed fire. I've worked with landowners. But the folks after me are going to be the ones who really know how to get stuff done and do the underground. So. I just want to try to set the stage for them. I'll try to do it quickly. When I agreed to do this with David, I didn't realize that it was a day after, or less than 24 hours after I was going to get back from a trip to Central America, so I'm a little jet lag. San Francisco was hell as usual and got me in way late last night. But I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to unmute, because I think they need me there. And if it doesn't work, there was going to be horrible feedback going on. So oh, oh. that didn't sound good. Try it again. You're going to mute an island or... That's not... That's not. So, I, can people hear me online? You should be able to be heard through the owl. Yeah. Through, through the owl? Right? Okay, the owl yeah. here. Then great. Yeah. I won't. Yeah. yeah, we got a thumbs up. That's good. All right. Let's share a screen and get going. I will try to move this quickly. I apologize if I speak quickly at some point, but I really would like to have time for questions with you all. So, let's make sure that this actually works. No, it doesn't work. Well, we'll do it without my notes. How is that? It normally works as a second screen. There we go. So I call it an anticipating surprise. A lot of the work we do, we use that word with the idea that, particularly under climate change, the lessons from the past are insufficient for you. are just going to be different. So we're trying to be able to look ahead, trying to understand how the landscape is changing, settlement is changing, to understand how we get ahead of the curve here before disaster happens. So I want to introduce just setting up the 2020 wake-up call. I think we all got here in the Willamette Valley. The idea the future is not going to be like the past. And I want to give some just basics on understanding wildfire and risk, things that have been really helpful to me and I've learned from fire researchers that I've worked with. So I want to, I want to talk about hazard and risk and then about thinking like fire. So we when to sort of empower you when you're looking at your land and your house and the neighborhood, you can actually start to think in the way that fire looks at and receives the landscape. I want to talk about how we might act in the South Hills at three scales. And then particularly the idea about thinking about more than wildfire create those solutions. So, you know, this was just an enormous set of wildfires, right? If you're like me, I was pretty much pinned in the house for about nine days with the smoke. Um, we were pretty darn fortunate that the winds died down when they did. If those of you remember that night of the, when the fire really blew up, it was these weird winds coming out of the east. It was hot, it was dry, what the heck's going on? And by the next day, when you looked online, it was a there had been a 20,000 hectare or acre fire, and suddenly it was 100,000 acres overnight. And I just thought, somebody made a mistake. When are they going to correct this on the Right, there's got to be an error. Cool down, humidity come up, doesn't happen. So that was one, of course, of this set of five, actually eight fires within Oregon. And I want to note in particular, look at this little one down there, Alameda Drive. So the smallest of all the fires, 3,200 acres, 3,000 structures burned. That's the one that really got into an urban density area, right? And our South Hills were, were one to four dwelling units to more per acre. The other fires were much bigger. Again, if the winds hadn't stopped, it would have been a whole different issue here. 
Um, it wasn't new that we have large fires in our area. If, on the map on the left, if I can move my screen out there, we've historically in these black areas had a lot of high, infrequent high severity fires. What was new, excuse me, sorry, but my computer is doing weird things here. It was not new to have large fires due to east winds, but what is new is we're facing increased humidity with hotter, drier summers, we have longer fire seasons, and we're likely to develop more overlap between our fire season and the thin winds. Here in Middle California, they call them the Santa Anas, the Diablo winds in Colorado, and what essentially is happening, for instance, in California is the Santa Ana winds are actually weakening under climate change. But the fire season is extending longer into the season of the winds, and that could happen with us. That's not the only way we can get large fires here, but it certainly is what happened in 2020. And you know, it was just like a blowtorch, these drone images coming down the valley there. So that even areas along the river that normally would have such high humidity, they'd be less likely to burn, it just torch like that. Um, this is an account from a landowner that I worked with, Jim Turber, who couldn't be here tonight. But I want to give you a sense of what he faced. And that's his before and afters of his house there up in Good Pasture Lane. About 12.45, an alarm went off on both our phones. I woke startled, not sure exactly what was happening. The text message said, evacuate now. You have five minutes. Do not collect anything. Leave now. My wife grabbed the cat, put her in the cat carrier. Our phones were our only lights. I'm hopping on my left foot and grabbed my computer, iPad, or boot. Outside, there was thick smoke and bugs everywhere, so thick you breathe them into your nose and mouth. I was useless on crushes. We got our dog and the cat into the hotter CRV. My wife grabbed two pictures, one a photograph of her mother when she was three, and a valuable piece of art hanging on to it. That was all they got out of their house, right? And just a tremendous loss there. Luckily, they had insurance. It worked out over time. They were among the lucky in that sense. Uh, Jim did send the messages. He recommends if you're in a fire city in your zone, have a go back. Kind of like David when people talk to him, but have a go back. Be ready, just be prepared for what's going on. So, so why my computer is doing this? There we go. So, when we work with the landowners out there, design students and I, develop these visualizations. So the one on the upper left is a LIDAR image. It's light image detected radar. So it's an act of reconstruction with drawn trees, but of the actual landscape. What does it look like? A very dense con of the forest up there that people love. That's what it looked like afterwards based on the LIDAR. And these other two images are reconstructions the students created about thinking differently about the future. So this landscape up there that people love was frankly an anomaly at times with increased fuels and fire suppression in the past. And in fact, the tendency, of course, is when people recover, is to try to get back what they had. Going back to that is the wrong idea. Particularly under climate change, we're looking at creating more fire adapted ecosystems that are thought to be fire resilient. And so in the future, for instance, here is a proposal to have scattered Douglas firs, more of an old community around the landscape, and a much easier place to protect your home as well as having vegetation that's less likely to burn completely down the fire of the June 2020. So the future won't be like the past. You've got to rethink what it means to have a good landscape around our homes, right, where we live. You have to think differently about it. So some of our research has been simulation modeling. And this is this great area, the study area, where we look at wildfire energy. We do not go inside the city limits here. So it's all about water. But the point I want to make is that there are some climate models, like the Muroc model, the general circulation model, that when we simulate them, say, actually, we're not going to have that much different wildfire up until about 2050, and then it gets a bit more. But it's not that different from the past. And that is a 50-year simulated fire footprint of what could happen from one among 50 different futures we simulated there. This was the one extreme run, a fire 8,000 hectares in size. That's about 20,000 acres, pretty big fire, that if you know that part of the landscape around our Vida, that would be quite a catastrophe should it happen. So even under a low climate simulation so or scenario, you could have a big fire. The one on the right is the average run of the other climate model we use to have it. Both of them are equally good at predicting the past. We don't know which one the future would be like. 
And in fact, when we went to publish on this, we were expecting reviewers to say, this is ridiculous. You've never had wildfire like this in Miami Valley. You know, we're skeptical of your climate models. In fact, that's an actual two-scale map of the location and size of the Holiday Farm Fire. And how close it came to get into our area and did it dwarf anything we predicted would happen. So let's talk about wildfire risk. So I want you to imagine that black line down the center is a wall, and you have a choice of being in one of those two rooms. Which room would you prefer to be in? I could force you to say the answer, but I think we all agree I'd rather be in the room on the left here. So it's the same tiger. Why would you rather be in the room on the left? You got a cage. It's not like getting it. So this is the difference between hazard and risk. Hazard is identical in both situations. If the tiger gets you, you're toast. But in the one on the left, risk is lower because the likelihood of the tiger getting you is far lower. This is really important because risk is about uncertainty. You don't know, it's probability. And so when people talk about risk, it's an ex expectation of value change, it's a likelihood. So it's the probability of something happening times the likelihood of that happening. And over time, what we're seeing is both hazard is going up in our landscape with increased fuels, but also risk is going up. Due to climate change, due to the values that we put in the way of that. So risk is increased in our landscape because of the loss of indigenous fire, fire suppression, smoking the bear since the 1920s or so, leading to increased fuels. And now we put more homes and people out in the middle of wildland fields where they're at risk. People want to enjoy being out in nature. We want nationalists around us. And now we've got climate change on top of it. So all of those factors have increased, have contributed to increasing risk. When we look backward in time at our landscape, I think Mount Pisgah is a pretty good window into the past that most of our landscape here was dominated by upland oak savanna and grassland. Imagine a fire burning through this. It's going to burn through the grasses, maybe a few trees toward it, but it's not that, it's a very different fire than in a, like a dense conifer forest. And so what's happened over time is we've gone from these open savannas with scattered trees that have infilled with dove firs coming in and turning these dense conifer forests. That's a whole different beast when it comes to wildfire. Now you can have cannon fires. Now instead of flames that are Two, one to two to ten foot high, you can have flames that are 150 foot high. And that changes the risk pretty dramatically. So here's a shot from California, and this just exemplifies how capricious fire is. But it obeys laws. I mean, you're looking through here and you're just saying, why did that house not burn? Why did every other burn? And why the heck is all that vegetation standing? One of the first lessons when we get into dense urban areas is that one of the key ways that fire can spread is from one structure to another structure. How many of you build a campfire or a fire in your fireplace, right? You know what it's like to arrange dry fuels from small to big to make them so the air can circulate around and you light it. If you do it well, the fire takes it. That's called a house, right? It's set up like a little boy still fire. In fact, when they make you go sticks, you go to the house with it, right? So fires in the peak of night and they start to burn could quickly spread from one house to another. So that becomes one of the main dangers within denser urban zones. Not just the vegetation around you, but your house igniting, your neighbor's house igniting, and spreading you. If you haven't seen the film out of, um, there's either Talent or Phoenix for that fire, you want to be horrified, look at it. Because the flames are blowing sideways, and it's just literally one house torching another, torching another. And that's why those 300,000 homes burned in just a few hours there. So there's nothing to do about it. But you see things like this. You see a picture during the fire, and then there it is after. So they found a way, or they were lucky, to keep that wooden structure there from night. And so I'm going to spend a fair bit of time, and I think our colleagues will spend a fair bit of time talking about what you can do around your home so that even if the vegetation is burning around you or your neighbors, your house is less likely to go off. So I want to weave together on the next slides three ideas about how we would use this. Acting at three scales thinking like wildfire, and then thinking about more than wildfire. And so let's think about the parcel scale, your home and your lot. Let's think about the neighborhood, my house, your house, the houses around the center block. 
And let's think about the landscape. Let's think about all the South Hills. And by that, I don't just mean the area where we have our houses. I mean about the South Hills in which our trail system is there, which is both a potential source of risk, but also a potential source of buffering us from fires that might come from the South if it's managed well. So to think about wildfire, there's a number of ways that wildfire can go wrong. There's the east winds, the dry east winds that come like a cold toilet. We have to think about surface fires and crown fires, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And in particular in that, we get into looking at the difference between forest fires and grassland fires. And keep in mind again that what transmits fires, one, it can be direct spread from fuel to fuel to fuel, particularly on a slope where fire is burning and preheating the fuels above it, drying them out. So a fire can move up quickly up the slope. But you can also have ember spotting, particularly when trees are torching or there's a crown fire, you're sending out sparks so wood can create embers that can carry two miles. And now you've got fires that are spotting ahead. And you have to get people have to try to suppress them and get ahead of them. So that makes it really difficult. And then finally, again, structural fires from one house to the other. And you want to think about what am I going to do to reduce risk? You have to keep all these factors in mind and look around and begin to evaluate. So here's an image of the Northwest Coast Canyon Forest. Interlocking trees and crowns, industrial forest you can see around you, often much denser than that. A surface fire is one that stays on the ground. Your flamings could be a foot tall, they could be ten foot tall, but it stays on the ground. These are much easier to control and suppress. You can block them with a bulldozer line. If it's a really low flame length, you can even block it with just a dirt path along the way. Once trees start torching, if there's fuels that lead from that ground flames, up into the canopy, you can get torching, and that can be even spotting that comes from that. But that ain't nothing compared to what happens when you get a canopy fire. When these tightly knit canopies allow fire to transfer, especially under high winds, from one tree to another to another, you can get two fires, and they're independent. There's a fire on the ground, and there's a fire moving through the canopy. And those canopy flames could be twice the height of the trees, perhaps. So now you're dealing with 150 foot flames going, and there's really no way to stop it. People don't try to stop off a head fire like that. They put flanking around it, try to do back burns, or try to suppress. But there's really very little you can do in that case, except to try to keep people in structures out there and protect homes right around them with the holes, for instance. So one of the key strategies people do in this is to create thinning the trees to keep space between the tree crowns so it's harder for the fire to go from one tree to another, particularly to set up a crown fire. And you remove the ladder fuels, things that carry it from the ground fuels up. You create discontinuity fuel. You'll probably see the from the folks later on about that. But that's a key strategy, how you keep it like this instead of like these other situations. So by thinking about wall, more wild, about more than wildfire, I mean that again, wildfire is uncertain. It may or may not come more in over the next 20 to 50 years. So if we do all these mitigation activities, and we do it purely for fire, and then we never have a fire, we just lost, wasted a lot of resources and effort. So think about creating a beautiful place around your home. Think about gardens. Think about wildlife habitat. Think about recreational corridors out in the South Hills, right? So always, I would argue, think about more than just wildfire when you're putting in mitigating that. At the parcel scale, then, I want to place us within this context from most of the work you see is done in wild and rural areas, and that's some of the slides I'm going to show about defensible space in rural areas. Mark, I just want to let you know it's been over 15 minutes. Has it? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Well, okay. Don't be sorry, but we have like 15 minute presentation and 15 minutes for question and answers. Would you guys like to go about five more minutes and then have a 10 minute that's question right. and answer? Like Thank okay. you so much. So, Urban Town Center, you're mostly in the Ember Zone, you don't have that many tools to burn get hit by numbers We're more in this sort of general residential suburban area, some of you may live in rural areas nearby. So it's it's not hard to build homes and houses and landscapes that won't burn where you're completely fireproof. Let's get past Rona for a minute. At the parcel scale then one of the classical strategies is defensive space. You need to manage the vegetation around your home. One of the lessons I've learned on is don't freak out. You don't need to create a death zone and nothing around your house to do this. We'll talk more about that, and I'm sure our colleagues will talk about that too. You can use fire-wise construction materials, fire-resilient building materials, certainly metal roofs, 
newer homes or having walls that are good for part. But the point I want to make is that's all good. But many times when homes set fire, it's because people may have leaves in their gutters, they start to burn, and then the embers get pulled into the vets that are underneath the rafters there. So there are now people are coming out with spark arresters to stop that. That may be one of the biggest things that we can do to prevent burning homes is to put in things like the spark arresters. Once the fire gets inside your home, it will just, it'll just blow up and be heat up with construction inside. Um, focus in the home ignition zone is really important. Under your porch, against the house, the gutters, just places where fire could lie and ignite your home, and particularly coming into spaces, cracks in your house and get inside. And we'll talk a little bit about this idea of fire resistant early vegetation. If you've heard about fire wires or defensible space, there are these different structural ignition zones, fire break zones, and reduce fuel burn. All this information is online for you to look at. And really trying to avoid this is probably the biggest concern. So, this is some of the students' work. The main point is just you can create vegetation that's fire resilient and unlikely to burn in ways that endanger your house. You can create pollinator gardens. You can use more fire resistant plants. You can create water features. You can have irrigated gardens around your home. Think about more than wildfire. Think about making a beautiful place to live for yourself. At the neighborhood scale, the key issue is that these ignition zones overlap. This is still a rural landscape. Most of us are denser than that. But what your neighbor does matters to you and how you work together with your neighbor matters. I'll make this sure this is available online if you want to look at these graphics. It's a very informative time to look at. Um, particular then, when you get in denser vegetation like this, you really have to work together as a neighborhood. Notice here, though, that the unmitigated versus the mitigated is not that different. They haven't created eradicated vegetation in that zone around it. Nor have they been able to do this. And I've seen some people go over the top of that. But for instance, when we work with our landowners up in Blue Pasture Lane, part of it is like, if you're creating these sort of shrubby areas and patches of the space between them, think about the sight lines to your neighbors. Maybe you'd rather have some privacy. So build that into the fire resilience you have there. At the, at the parcel scale, I'm actually going to skip through this. This is some simulation modeling we did from around Eugene. This is actually a fire burning from this area out. The point I wanted to make was these colored areas there are patches of fire treatments and thinnings and restored savannah. And even though that fire looks big in our simulations, that cut the fire size to about one-tenth of what it would have been if that hadn't been placed there. What's important then is that we, again, we live in an area that was largely the savannah grasses over time. Because they filled in, become dense conifer forests in areas around us, they create a much different hazard and through that much greater risk for us. So a lot of my work is about how we combine restoration at landscape scales and home scales with these oak savanna landscapes with scattered oaks, grasslands, other vegetation as a way to mitigate fire. Grasslands can have long flame lengths, but that's nothing compared to what happens in a forest fire. So again, my, a lot of my work is thinking about what the reasons in which we can use Osamana restoration, grassland restoration, other features to pre-adapt to wildfire and create mosaics of grassland that are not only good for habitat for wildlife, but create suppression points. They interrupt the flow of fire, even if there are untreated forests nearby, if they drop down, suppression activities come into place. And in the south hills, I'll end on these last three slides here, the idea of creating shaded fill breaks, restoring old woodland savanna, providing access points and trail systems for fire management, prescribed fire and suppression, and linking risk reduction to open space recreation, habitat restoration, and reintroducing good fire, prescribed fire. So I hope that as a neighborhood, we can advocate for this kind of management out in the South Hills, because there are a lot of people who don't want to see it change. They don't want to see trees stuff. They don't want to see anything happen. But I would argue differently. You can create fuel breaks. These are some visualizations of different ways that you can interrupt the flow of forest fire with recreational paths. You can use power line assessments. You can create staging areas, so on shaded. Um, in any type of, whether it's a forest or a woodland or savanna, there are ways to treat that to make it more fire resilient. These were examples of creating habitat for wildlife. You can do this in your backyard. You can do it at the scale of the South Hill. Um, we think about the pathways through which fire can come to Eugene. Clearly, we have these east wind events that can drive down the valleys. 
But I'd also argue that when we're under south winds, we can have the ridge line trail system can be either a hazard for us or it can be a buffer, depending on how it's managed. The city is trying to do a good job. They face a lot of resistance. And lastly, just think about prescribed fire situation. Prescribed fire generates smoke. People don't like smoke. There are health issues. There are allergies we have to pay attention to. But the difference between a prescribed fire smoke and what happens when a holiday farm fire occurs is pretty dramatic. In particular, when you're in areas where houses are burning, that's when the toxics are coming out, when plastics and all these things that are in our homes are burning and creating an extraordinary health hazard. So to talk about it more, I'm a big advocate for bringing prescribed fire into our neighborhoods. And I'll ask you to think about how you work with neighbors. So sorry I went over, shut that down. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah. If you have a few acres uh, around your neighborhood houses and you have all that ice fallen branches you mm -hmm. know, around and through that like two or three acre wood, do you recommend like maybe sawing that those branches up and getting them on the ground or what do you think? Sure, sure. I think a lot of this also gets to how you're using the land. Certainly when uh, there's a number of ways to think about this. When you're often thinning trees and doing fire hazard thinning, you generate a lot of what's called slash on the ground, right? And people typically pile it, they burn it, they'll dry it up, they'll remove it in that way. You can have somebody come in and chip it up, but generally piling it is going to, one, get it out of your way and reduce the likelihood that from fuel during the fire. After a number of years, after it's broken down, except under exceptionally hot, dry conditions, those logs, you have to have kindling to get logs burning. So a lot of it depends about packing it down and getting it out. But I wouldn't tear up your land just to do that either. Don't keep it up in a big ranch. And well, I'd be aware of going out where the soils are moist with the big heavy equipment and compacting your soils and things like that too. Yeah. What else? Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Sabrina. You'll have to unmute. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask the question, but also I wanted to ask them. I was a little late to the meeting. Can I miss the public comment? Can I make a public comment? This is a talk right now, so I think a public yeah, comment here no, is passed. Public, yeah, public comment is over, I'm sorry. Possible to ask after these done? I mean, to speak after these done for my public comment? No, sorry. No. So any other questions? Anybody here on Zoom? Question for you. Um, do you know about the role of smart utility meters and fires, you know, the AMI? I, I couldn't, I, no, I honestly couldn't answer that about the role of wall fire. Could not. Sorry. What else? Yeah. You mentioned something um, to put on vents to prevent fire. And I don't know enough about them, but they're becoming very commonly used in construction in California. I see somebody in the back not even there too. Okay. Yeah. So I, they are coming on, whether you retrofit or whether it's more new construction, I don't know, but it had been on the east side too, people are really paying attention to that. Again, you can have a metal roof, you can have unburnable walls. If the sparks and embers get sucked in the vents that come into your house, they can set your house on fire from the inside. I think all the building in Paradise Fire, they all had that. It was, it was they did have that. They were required to have a And it didn't stop. Yeah. So there's. I've never seen any literature that shows a foolproof solution to this. And even like defensible space, I do the analysis. Of how much defensible space reduce losses? And the studies are all over the place. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Fire is vicarious, it depends on the conditions there. But think about reducing the probability that something's gonna happen. You're reducing the risk, risk is uncertain. Yeah. Of course, metal roofs are a great um, choice. They're very, very expensive. They are. Um, what do you think of uh, other materials for roofs um, and, you know, what's the comparison between, I'm sure they're coming out with more and more other sure. materials that are pretty fire resistant. Is it dramatically different with any of those? And, and that's why I'm going to punt that one to my colleagues when they give their talk because I'm sure they know much more about that than me. I will say though, I mean, I live at, so there's two things we can go wrong here, I think. And I live right here on Tugman Park. I've got a woodland next to me, I've got a lot of fuels around me. I've seen people who live in dense downtown urban regime who freaked out during the holiday farm fire that they were going to burn up. And I was like, you know, I don't think you have too much to worry about. There's no fuels around me. You know, it's just very unlikely to happen. I'm near a lot of fuels. I'm actually not super concerned because I've kept it clear around my home 
the vegetation right around my home is not likely to burn, and I feel I'm in pretty good condition. I'm, I, sir, I'm worried about fire igniting things around my house, but I'm not going to freak out and change my landscape about it. But I am taking care of it. So don't do too little, but don't go crazy. Anybody else? Um, I don't know. We're running out of time. Right. I'm sorry. Because right. so, we need yep. to get on to the next amazing people. So thank you so right. much. Folks are from uh, the West Lane District of the Order Department, Forestry, um, Kate John and McKenna Armitrop. We'll uh, give a spread. And this uh, Kate and I, this one, Kate and I uh, spoke, I don't know, probably last summer. Um, mm -hmm. As y'all, I mean, some of you uh, signed up for the neighborhood assessment. We come in for, we have six volunteers who went around the neighborhood looking at folks at homes, we weren't professional, so we were, uh, we did the quality assessments, so we were, but I think it's pretty, a lot of the, a lot of what Bart talked about around the house is pretty straightforward, so anyway, so Kate and I spoke, and they got some funding to do this work inside the urban, uh, inside the city, but that's been very difficult, most of the funding is from rural properties, so they're going to talk about the properties and show you a map of our neighbors who've had this work done by the Department of Energy. Yeah, I guess I'll start with um, talking a little bit about the pencil space. They're focusing more on our grant program. Um, we talked a lot about hardscaping, which is um, working on your house and replacing the roof and stuff. Well, our program focuses more on the vegetation around the home. We follow the Oregon State Fire Marshal Standards, um, which follows research done in 2000s by Dr. Jack Cohen. Um, which kind of focuses on this idea of pilot ignition, which is preventing the heat of the fire and the vegetation around your home from um, igniting the siding of your house. So we kind of really focus on the vegetation around the house. And my colleague McKenna and I, um, in the summer, we're, we're involved in fire. And then in the winter, we're involved in grant programs. Fire is a big part of our life. So hopefully we can answer a little more of your fire-specific questions at the end. Um, do you have anything to add, Mika? I was just say I know we're limited on time, so we're going to just focus mostly on what our program does. And then if you guys do have more questions about defensible space, hardscaping at the end, I mean, if we have time for that, we can also try to answer those for you as well. So we'll kind of skip over the overview. Yeah. We'll get over it. Um, <laughs> uh, scope of work. So as I mentioned before, that's our crew. Um, we run a crew of about seven working on defensible space, so 150 feet around homes, reducing vegetation and then in ingress and egress out of um, driveways. We also focus on fuel breaks. So as the professor mentioned, kind of working pro property lines, um, making strategic fuel breaks um, to reduce or slow down the um, run of fire in the case of an emergency. We also focus on educational outreach, such as site assessments, um, other outreach events like this, and creating firewise communities. I will mention that our site assessments Say we, there was no fuels reduction for our crew to do, we could still come out and do site assessments on properties to talk about hardscaping um, and other defensible space options outside of what our crew does. Um, and part of, I'll just add to that really quick. Our crew runs with chainsaws and weed eaters, and we also have a chipper. And so we, you know, we'll limb up trees, we'll remove underbrush, uh, blackberry, stuff like that, and then we'll chip material that's cut on your properties as well. So here are our current grants. Um, right now, we're you guys are in the Fox Hollow area. Um, I like to note that sometimes there's a little misconception that when you sign up for a grant, the work will be done right away or the following year. We actually have to manage multiple grants at one time, so it's kind of, you know, it may take more than a year for us to get to your property. We try to go through as fast as we can, but these are our current grant boundaries um, that we're working on. And then here are, since 2022 to current day, the treatment areas that we've worked on in this area. As you can see, it's kind of all the red parts. And then um, you can go to the next one. The next one shows the site assessments and fuel treatments completed in the area. Um, and we're still currently um, taking the time to do site assessments. Uh, we're trying to fill up this map and um, help the community as a whole because we find um, fire defense and mitigation is best when done in a community. And I will just mention with 
I'll go back to that. I will just mention um, that typically in order to get a hold of landowners when we first have an active grant that's opening, we will send out mailers and then from there a really effective way to get landowners signed up is through word of mouth, which is why you see a lot of like different neighborhood areas treated because that whole neighborhood will contact us and then we'll communicate with them, get everybody signed up and then be able to treat the whole neighborhood, which um, as Bart was talking about in his presentation, that's kind of one of the levels of treatment um, when, the, when you have those three levels is on a neighborhood scale, treating the whole neighborhood because uh, your guys' defensible space areas will overlap, so it's really important to do that as well to create a more resilient community. Um, so we just wanted, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the background of our grant process just so that um, people understand kind of um, how it works and then um, we will also talk about future funding. Um, but basically what in our program what happens is ODF will apply to a federal grant um, and so typically we'll apply to a geographically tied area and we have to apply for areas within our entire protection district um, and those are decided based on need and also trying to service areas throughout the entire district not just focusing on one area every single year. Um, I will say that South Eugene is a really big area that we focus on which is why we typically have at least one to two every single year um, in my experience in being part of the program so um, yeah we kind of we so we apply based on geographical area and then uh, most of our grants are active for three years um, so that's why we we can't necessarily get to people right away. It might take a little bit of time for our crew to be able to actually come out and do the work um, once a grant is active. Um, and then uh, once a grant is active in the area, like I said before, we will do outreach through mailers to kind of give landowners a heads up like, hey, there's this grant opportunity in our area, contact us, and then we can go ahead and schedule you for a site assessment and come out and then look at what work could be done for you. Um, and then once you're signed up with the site assessment, we have you on our list, and then it's a first come, first serve basis. Um, so <clears throat> once we're w once we move to an active grant area that we're going to work on, we'll go out do the site assessment. But it could take a couple months before our crew actually gets to your property. Um, but you'll still be on our list, and um, we also just you know let landowners know, hey, if it seems like it's taking a long time, you can call us, check where you're at on the list, and then we'll give you a status update. Um, but for example, we, we've done a lot of site assessments in Fox Hollow area that took place over the summer and even last spring, and we are just now getting to them, so that's kind of the timeline for um, getting to treat, to treat landowner areas. Um, and then for future funding and other opportunities, um, we usually will try to keep at least three active grants every year, so we're applying typically at least one annually, um, and depending on funding, we might not apply for some, some years. Um, and then the application process is a year-long process, and then it takes a while after that for us to actually get the funding. So let's say we run out of funding for an area and then landowners are still interested, well, we could apply for another grant for that area, but it could take up to almost like two years before we're actually able to start work in that area again. Um, so that just it just kind of depends on where we write the grants at and then the, that timeline. Um, and then I just wanted to mention really quickly that there's also other funding sources available to landowners if, uh, for, if you know, we don't have any funding available for you in that year or that moment. Um, Lane County Firewise is one program. They have a grant incentive program that I believe runs annually um, that you can apply for. Um, this year the applications were in February and they do focus more on uh, hardscaping for homes so they they will give funding to landowners to replace your roof or replace your windows siding and stuff like that and then they also have funding for defensible space and they prioritize based on um, based on higher needs so if, for example if somebody has a wood shake roof that's gonna be higher priority to them than something that's you know a uh, lower risk to the home itself um, so that's kind of how their process works and I, we have contact information for that program as well if anyone is interested. And then another one for, this may not pertain as much to this neighborhood because it's more for larger scale, but NRCS does have um, funding um, to do fuel reduction work and that's more tied to you know changing the landscape to a more oak woodland savanna habitat type. So that's another route if, if you have a larger scale um, property. 
So we kind of, I know we kind of rushed through that, but we wanted to make sure there was time for questions. Uh, so at this time, if anybody has any questions for us, we could be happy to answer them. Could you tell us how many properties in our neighborhoods, we're, we're southeast neighbors, so further south, uh, how many assessments have you done uh, in the last seven months? In the southeast area, we kind of just lump them into like the Eugene Fox Hollow area, probably at least like say like 70 or 70. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know about just specifically to the southeast area. Yeah, I was saying so, inside the UGB inside the city. Oh, I see. Oh, inside the city, um, not that many, honestly. We've probably only done like, probably like 10, 10, I'd yeah. say, at mm -hmm. the most. Yeah, yeah. Could you um, just stop sharing your screen so in case oh, somebody yeah, sorry. has a question, we can see? Yes. Sorry. No worries. There we go. Yeah. Go ahead. In the front. Okay. Um, yeah, so you talked about it's really good to have a, a neighborhood group collaborate and, and approach you to have one area covered. What if um, um, you're interested and you have a a dense area of untreated woodland right next to our, our situation, our condo, 16 acres owned by a state corporation, totally dense, never cleaned up, and we tried to contact them, and no response, they're in Colorado, and is, to, is there any leverage that any government or anyone has? We're told only if your grass grows high, we can, but it's all trees that have been yeah. affected by two ice storms over yeah. the years. ODF, specifically, we can't do anything about other properties, we have to have landowner um, consent to do anything on properties, but I do know that I was told by Lane County that they you can uh, file complaints about situations like you're talking about and they might be able to do something about it. Um, I don't have much more information beyond that um, for that kind of a situation. Can a site assessment be uh, involved? I see you're adjoining neighbors, uh, you're closely adjoining neighbors that you share. Uh, Oh yeah, they can definitely. Are it only property address specific, or could it involve? Like what communities are saying? Yeah, it could involve three addresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Especially to work boundary lines, we have all the people working lined up for that. We can do that easily. You had a question? Oh, um, I was just going to say there used to be um, a city program where you could call and report distressed trees on properties and they would come out and look and make an assessment. I'm not sure about that at all. I We don't work much with the city right I now, see. so I'm not, they, they could that still That might have be that. something that's mm -hmm. not, is an abandoned program mm -hmm. too by now. I think it came out of a time, you know, this was about 20 years ago or so, maybe 25 years ago, when a fir tree fell down on a woman's house. She'd been complaining about it, complaining about it, and it fell down and it, and it killed her, finally. In the South Eugene somewhere. I, I can speak a little bit to that because I was just reading about it up at Art Storm, like who's responsible, like who's liable for different things. And city websites, it's pretty much, um, you have to take care of it if it falls on your house, no matter where it fell on, or on any part of your property, no matter where it originated from. But also, like as far as getting a tree out that might be a distressed tree, it has to be certified as dangerous by an arborist. Mm -hmm. And so that would be up to the owner of the tree to have had that happen and have that document. And in that case, then you, the tree needs to be removed. If they don't remove it, then they're liable. And that's pretty much all that there really is to read about it out there. Did we notified of so a neighboring corner about a potential tree uh, in windfall and they uh, Yeah, I mean, it, it's a moral issue, right? It's a good neighbor policy, as far as I can tell. It's like, hope, hope you have them. <laughs> I've seen some presentations on how climate change affects what's in our forests here, that kind of a zone of hot weather is sort of moving north, or that we might be looking at different types of different species of trees predominating in the future. And I'm wondering, are you looking at that? And how does that work out as far as fire resilience? If we have more trees that normally prospered and thrived in California growing here, are we going to be more fires 
necessarily or less if, if and you know the same as with our wet weather wet climate trees kind of uh, peter out and go move northward um, if we started looking at that for what type of trees to plant or what to cut or yeah definitely i mean when we when we go when our crew goes out and um chooses trees to cut down we're usually trying to leave more native we leave a lot of oak trees we're focusing on cutting out conifers and things that are going to be more flammable um, and leaving those more fire resistant species so that is a focus that we have um, and i don't know if you have more to say. yeah i was going to say the osu extension has um, a whole list out on um, fire resistant plants for for communities so um if anyone has interest at the end, I also have some handouts about hardscaping and defensive space in general. I'll put them in the back, but um, I'll also leave my card. So if you're interested in this in that resource, um, email me. And I'll get that to you. I'm curious if there's any interface between the agriculture department or, or uh, fire preparedness folks um, around the ash trees and what's happening or expected. That's a good question. We don't deal with that side at all. We're very fire focused mm -hmm. within our program. Um, there's probably, we probably have foresters at our office who could probably speak a little more to that possibly. Um, I know that most most of our Salem representatives, they deal with like em or ash trees and the them dying, dying off. But I could definitely uh, write that question down and try to find an answer for you. So Springfield Fire just posted um, earlier today about a um, somebody's arborvitae, you know, hedge between houses going up in flames in south, uh, southwest PA. And then somebody asked online, well, what are we supposed to plant instead for like fast growing and tall privacy? Um, what would be better? Um, and so I thought I would like kind of put it on put it to you guys. Yeah, so I'll just speak again to Kate's, uh, Kate mentioning the, the fire resistant um, resources out there. So OSU Extension actually has a fire resistant uh, plant book and PDF online that you can look at that gives a lot of different options. Um, I am not an expert on like shrubbery that would be good for um, just being used as a buffer. Um, I, I know like off the top of my head I want to say like uh, rhododendrons are fire resistant um, in that resource. Um, do you, can you think of any other ones? I can't. I do have. I have. I don't have enough to give everyone one, but I have a couple pamphlets um, of fire resistant plants. I think Laurel is one as well. I think he's had a comment. UM also has a nature scaping publication, and they also have some work that our students did around that. One thing I kind of find with the fire resistant vegetation ones are sort of universally exotic ornamental species. Mm -hmm. We have less information, but a lot of our natives would be equally good as that. So just look at the list, but take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. There's, I think you start to lose state principles, like watch out for conifer with a lot of turpins, they flash burn. I've seen fires, prescribed fires, where conifers are torching, and the oaks, it kind of gets the leaves and just dies down. Mm -hmm. So the basic principles you can get are people can I get that re the resource from you yeah, afterwards? Yeah. yeah. One other question. It goes back to sort of David talking. Since most of the people in the neighborhood are in you know, urban settings, quarter acre or less lots and stuff, is, and most of the defensive space work is out in where people are mixed with wild and fire fuels on larger lots. So are there any particular strategies you've adapted in urban neighborhoods where people are more likely to have a small lot? For instance, the one that Spoke up about saying neighbors getting together. That makes sense to me because now it scales up to the sense we say now we can actually manage fire and we scale up to more than one quarter of the lot. But there are other typical strategies you use inside town? Inside town? Yeah. Um I I mean I think the biggest one is just like all getting together in neighborhood scales and trying to all treat together. Um I know with that that just brings to mind Firewise Communities. That's a program, um, I'm sure you've heard of it, but 
um, that's a good way to kind of organize a community or a neighborhood so that they are working um, working on fuels reduction and working on making that whole entire neighborhood more fire resilient over the years and so um, we also have information on that if any if any neighborhoods are interested in pursuing that program because um, that is a good way to get everyone together talking about it coming up with an action plan and we also um, we do come out and do a community risk assessment when when you're signing up for that program would you agree that again when i've looked at this test was always space and literature is all over the place but one thing does come consistent is that ignition zone right around the house and making sure your house has been burned and you've got leaves in the gutters mm -hmm. things powder would you agree that that's a good place for people to start absolutely that's what we tell people who feel are feeling overwhelmed even out in wo more wooey area wildland urban interface areas or more forested areas we still tell them to focus on the house first focus on your gutters your roofs any nooks and crannies where leaves and needles can kind of accumulate because that's acting as kindling and at the end of the day if there is a large wildfire you're going to have to evacuate and leave so you want to leave your home in the best you know in the best state um, to survive because you won't you won't be there so um, I 100% we agree with that yeah for sure any more questions Thank you so much.